Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Kara Circle. Kara Circle is a nonprofit programming arm of Kara's Books, and Kara's Books is the South's oldest independent women's bookstore. We're coming to you live from Decatur, Georgia, um, with a live audience and a virtual audience saying hello to all of our friends who are watching from around the world. We know we got a lot of New Yorkers in the house. <laughs> Craig is causing my ruckus already. Um, <laughs> We're delighted to be here with all of you tonight to honor the new book, Desire Lands, Desire Lines by Carrie Allen Johnson. Um, we are very honored to have this event co-sponsored by Thrive, by the Counter Narrative Project, and by Abundant Hub, um, three very important organizations here in Atlanta. And we want to encourage folks and around the country, we want to encourage folks to know about these organizations if you do not already. So first I'm gonna introduce Gary Allen Johnson, the man of the hour. He is an author, activist, and activist raised in Brooklyn and currently living in Central Africa. He studied writing with Wesley Brown, Jane Cooper, Alexis Defoe, Randall Keenan, Louise Merriweather, and Susan Stark Merrill. He has a bachelor's degree from Sarah Lawrence College and a master's degree in international affairs from Columbia's University School of International and Public Affairs. A longtime innovator in national and international queer politics and cultural activism, he was a founder of several groundbreaking organizations, including the Black Art Collective, Gay Men of African Descent, other countries, and the International Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission. A public health and HIV specialist with experience living and working in Guyana, Haiti, Mali, Rwanda, Senegal, South Africa, Ukraine, and Zimbabwe. Carrie is currently the country director of Population Services International in Berlin. And he is joined tonight by our friend Craig Washington. Craig served as a manager of prevention programs at Aid Atlanta, the largest aid services organization in the Southeast. He supervises five intervention programs, including the Deeper Love Project for Black Gay Men, the Evolution Center for Young Black Gay Men, the Gay Outreach Program, primarily for white gay men, HIV counseling, testing and referral services, and the Comprehensive Risk Counseling Services team. He has written various articles and editorials for the Atlanta Journal Constitution, Arise, Atlanta Voice, the Black AIDS Institute, Southern Voice, Venus Magazine, and the Washington Glee. He is one of the individuals featured in the 2007 documentary film, The AIDS Chronicles. His essay, A Revolutionary Act, is included in the 2006 anthology, Not In My Family, AIDS in the African American community. In October 2007, he received the Phil Wilson Advocacy Award from the Balm and Gilead Inc. He graduated magna cum laude with a Master's of Social Work from GSU in May of 2008. So we are very honored to be in such distinguished company. We want to encourage folks who are in this room to know you can ask questions. There will be plenty of time and the folks watching at home. But at this moment, I'm going to kick it right over to Craig. And we're going to get this party started. So, welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, wow, Carrie, I just want to say, just to start, um, what an honor and privilege it is to be part of this conversation and to thank you for the gift of this book of Desire Minds. It's an amazing, it's an amazing story. So, one of the things that just struck me is given the, 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 the weight and the focus, what is it about this story that you feel that, that maybe it had to be told, it had to be written, and it had to be read and heard? Uh, okay. Um, do you want me to read it first? Sure. Um, I just uh, think if maybe I, I read for a bit. Then I, one, I'll give, give you some context. Okay. Okay. And two, then I'm done. <laughs> with the reading part of this piece, and I can relax, um, you know, because that's, that's always the part that's a little maybe stressful. Um, I'm good at running my mouth and answering questions. Um, yeah, thank you. So, uh, great to be here, um, and thanks to, to Kara's books and more. Um, and uh, to, I want to call out, shout out again, the, the co-sponsors of the event, Abundant Love, Strive, Social Services, and the Counter Narrative Project, and, you know, uh, three really important organizations. And uh, just in terms of the bookstore, you know, I just want to say support your local in 
independent bookstore. Yes. Because for those of us who are publishing with independent presses, you, you can't get in, you can't read at Barnes and Noble. Even independent bookstores, you know, have to, you know, pay the rent. Mm -hmm. So 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 please do support them. Um, I'm gonna read two sections uh, from two sections of the book. And um, just maybe just by a, a bit of introduction, um, there are two characters um, in the second part that I'm going to read. One is named Rocco and one is named Rocky. And because the names are kind of similar, you know, I think it, it, I just want to clarify so people don't get a little, don't get lost. And so I think, um, let me start with, I want to start with the, epi, uh, with the epigraphs. Um, the first one is from uh, uh, John Ritchie's novel, Numbers. Triumphantly. The thought of sex has driven away the thought of death, at least for now. The second epigraph is from James Baldwin's Just Above My Head. I prefer sinners and madmen who can learn, who can change, who can teach. Fall 1982. There are a dozen peep shows strung along 8th Avenue like lights on a gaudy Christmas tree, with predictable names like Circus, The Playhouse, and Peeperama. Their neon signs flash 24 hours a day. Inside, rows of narrow booths with flimsy plywood doors offer a selection of five-minute porn reels. The customers, straight, gay, and everything in between, come in search of an erotic fantasy whether on the flickering screen or with another customer or a hustler. Mildly active during the day, the peeps come alive in the evenings when the Johns are coming from work and the rent boys roll in to ply their trade. By six o'clock, the walls are lined with young hustlers of every color and type. Latin bugarones sporting bulging muscles, black homeboys thick with macho confidence and white boys from the outer boroughs smiling their cutest smiles. Some are fresh out of jail, a few are strung out on dope, and the others are simply out to make a few bucks to tide them over until payday. Each promotes his best feature as he leans seductively against the grimy walls. In this city of stark divisions, the peeps are where the Wall Street banker can rub elbows with the bike messenger, and the advertising exec can lust after the guy who works in the mailroom. $20, sometimes even a sawbuck, is enough to break down the barriers. In these hallways, rife with the sense of disinfectant and sweat, high stakes deals are cut. The two players will slide discreetly into a booth, drop a few quarters in the machine and watch a blue movie. They will stroke their dicks, exchange a blowjob, they might even kiss. But as soon as the deed is done, they will pull up their pants, straighten their hair, and rush out of the booth, faces adorned with triumph, guilt, or both. If tomorrow they were to pass on the street, they would ignore each other and keep walking. The peeps are managed by grizzled men of indeterminate ages whose primary responsibility is to break bills into quarters, to feed the hungry machines. Times Square veterans, most of them are aged out hustlers and retired grifters. They are regularly called upon to mediate conflicts between hustlers and Johns, usually disputes over payments of fees or the lack thereof. I had passed all this tonight, eager to meet my boys at the bar. 96 West is located appropriately on 96th Street and Columbus Avenue. It's one of the best bars in the city, in my humble opinion. If you want to dance, the music is usually good. If you're planning to imbibe, the drinks are always strong. If you're hoping to snatch up somebody for the night, there's always a good selection. Jeff and Lil Pete are installed on their regular stools. Jeff is a brown skinned boy from Corona, tall and lanky, with a set of shoulder length dreads. He's smart as a wimp but easygoing and modest. His best friend, Lil Pete, is 6'4 and at least 230 solid pounds with skin the color of a freshly baked sugar cookie. A Mississippi transplant, 
He speaks with a honey-infused drawl that charms the heck out of the city boys. Heads moving subtly to the music, they're slamming our usual elixir tequila shots with beer backs. These two are the height of cool. I call them my bar buddies because our relationship exists almost entirely in the clubs. What we know about each other is based on what we observe or share during the witching hours of nightlife. A few years older than me, the two of them have seen everything the gay life has to offer. Their calm and collected attitudes are just what I need right now. I pull up behind them, throw my arms around Jeff's broad shoulders and kiss Pete on the back of his head. Hey boy, Lil Pete greets me. Look at what the cat dragged in, Jeff says and motions to the bartender to bring us another round. The bartender is one of Jeff's old tricks, a cute guy with black hair and a bushy beard built like a running back. He's tight, but thick. He sets us up with fresh shot glasses and pulls them from a bottle of Cuervo. Bottoms up, Pete says. The three of us slam the smoky tasting liquor and finishing it and finish it off with a bracing bite into a slight slice of lime. Jeff and Lil Pete absorb the impact of their shot, but mine nearly knocks me off my stool. Shit, I managed to cough out. Lightweight motherfucker, Pete laughs, <laughs> and the two of them share a high five. Fuck you guys, I said, recomposing myself on the stool as the bartender brings over three bottles of beer. I met Jeff and Lil Pete at Keller's, a shoebox of a bar at the end of Christopher Street, one Friday night after I'd gotten back from college. They were standing on either side of the blaring jukebox like a couple of handsomely carved bookends. Buff and confident, they were hard to ignore. I took up a position near them, and within seconds, three sets of brown eyes were shooting not-so-subtle looks back and forth through the smoke-filled bar. Eventually, we all started laughing at the crazy triangulation of our cruising. They introduced themselves, and I found out that they were best friends. We talked, drank, and cut up until the bar closed and poured us out onto West Street. You're a cool brother, Jeff said as I followed them like a puppy dog to their car. But when they when we got there, they wished me a good night. See you next week, Lil Pete grinned at me through the car window as they drove off. Same time. I was disappointed. I was ready to go home with either or both of them. But sure enough, the next week they were waiting for me in the same spot. Over the next few months and without a lot of fanfare, I became their third musketeer. You need a posse in New York, one or two ride or dies to help navigate the labyrinths of gay life. I've learned an important lesson from them. Making a new friend is more valuable than scoring another one night stand. Where's everybody? I asked, noticing the crowd is unusually sparse. Oh shit, Jeff, Jeff Lil Pete teases. Somebody's on the prowl. Nah, man, I reply a little defensively. This place is usually a little fuller. Slow your roll, Pete says. It's still early. I sip my drink and think about the New York Times article. I'd be lying if I said it hadn't spooked me. What's up with you, bro? Jeff asks, sensing something amiss in my mood. Yeah, what you tripping on tonight, Deep Thoughts? Deep Thoughts. That's Pete's nickname for me. The first time he called me that, I figured he was reading me for being stuck up or overly intellectual. But he paired it with such a sweet, sexy look into my eyes that I began waiting for him to say it again. I'm good, I reply, unsure whether I should bring up anything that might spoil, spoil the mood. But what you guys hearing about this gay cancer? Leave it to this nigga to always be bringing up some depressing shit, Lil <laughs> Pete says to Jeff. You had a brother on the four wheel tip, you were a little more gross, Jeff agrees. They've been on the scene longer than me and generally treat me like a smart ass little brother who's always stirring the pot. Why are you worried about some shit like that? Lil Pete asks. Pete, Jeff interrupts. Check out the guy in the yellow coochie sweater walking in the door. Little Pete turns his head ever so discreetly to assess a new gladiator entering the arena. Yeah, that'll do, Pete says, sizing up the boy. The bartender pours us another round of shots as more men start to fill into the bar. I read that that age shift is caused by poppers, Jeff says, 
seamlessly resuming our more serious conversation. I stopped using that shit a few years ago, Pete says. Made me fuck like a beast, but then it gave me a hell of a headache. <laughs> you guys aren't worried about catching it? I'm looking for some accurate information from the only big brothers I've got. That's some white boy shit, Jeff says. Look at Lil Pete absently squeezes his left bicep with his right hand as if to reassure himself of his solidity. Brothers mainly sleep with other brothers, right? As long as we keep the fucking in the family, we'll be okay. His confident tone seems to signal that with this brilliant analysis, the conversation has now been concluded. But his logic neither comforts nor convinces me. Pete, that's some simple sounding bullshit. Jeff beats me to the punch. Besides, plenty of brothers be dipping and dabbing with white boys. They both look at me, part accusation, part concern. Okay, it's true. Though I've got plenty of black friends, most of the guys who make it into my better white. But Jeff can't say shit about it. He, he may keep it on the down low, but I know he's got a thing for light skin Latins. Yo, deep thoughts. I don't know anyone who's sick, do you? Pete asks. I don't, and I tell him so. Listen here, little Pete says, real country life. About this age shit, we got enough to worry about already. It's all just some Reagan-inspired fake-ass epidemic, Jeff chimes in, sounding preachy. Remember the Tuskegee experiment? How the government let all those poor black farmers with syphilis go untreated to see what would happen? It's the same thing. But this time, gay people are the guinea pigs. Where does that leave us, I ask? Black and gay. I feel like I've got a target on my back. Gay, cancer, heart attack, diabetes, Jeff says uh, resignedly. Something's going to kill you before your time. Unless 5-0 puts a bullet in your pretty head first, Pete leans over and grabs me in a headlock. I like it when he treats me like this roughhouse but fraternal. His embrace calms me down. As, as harsh as they sound, I find solace in Lil Pete's comforting equations and Jeff's ready nihilism. It's 1982, and we are the cream of the crop, young and hearty men with possibilities stretching endlessly before us. We are clever boys with elite educations, killer looks, and unbridled ambition. Our futures weigh on us with such solemn beauty that it almost hurts. This disease, whatever its name is, has got fuck all to do with us. If you'll indulge me, I'm just going to read one more section. Spring 1986. I distract myself by surveying the club and catch a glimpse of Rocco on the other side of the room, standing next to a man who can't possibly be Rocky, but it is. It's Rocky, leaning precariously against the wall. It's been less than a year since I saw Rocky at Steve's party, but his transformation is startling. His eyes are sunken and he is rail thin. The strands of his once thick afro are now soft and silky like the hair of an old woman. Even from a distance, I can see that he is doing his best to look steady, but only the wall keeps him from falling. <coughs> For years, Rocky was an object of desire for many of the black boys on the gay scene, me included. Coveted for his sculpted body, six foot frame and upbeat personality, his attractiveness was only heightened by his partnership with an equally desirable Caucasian man. Rocky was off the market. We could not have him. So we wanted him that much more. How can you change this much? since I last saw him. Rocco catches me looking in their direction and offers a tentative smile. I shift my eyes and pretend that I haven't seen them. Guilt fills my stomach like bile. I'm ashamed of myself for avoiding Rocco's eyes, but I'm horrified by how Rocky leans against the wall, unable to support himself. I'm furious at the way his perfection has been diminished. I'm relieved that I didn't go home with the two of them that night when Steve's party ended. My emotions are rolling into each other and I'm starting to feel dizzy. The light in the room seems to change. Everything seems off kilter and out of sync. It's as if making eye contact with Rocky has lifted a veil 
and I can suddenly see sickness everywhere, men at the bar, on the dance floor, sitting at cocktail tables, glasses full of rum. I look back over at Rocky, the chestnut icon who made the boys drool. Slowly, he begins to vanish, bit by bit of him fading into the air. It's as if his elements start to vibrate, crystallize, and then fizzle until he is gone. I look at Rocco. One second he's there, big as life, but a moment later there's nothing but empty space where he once stood. Men on the dance floor start to disappear. Mid-sentence, random guys at the bar lose form and merge into the nightclub semi-darkness. I look Pete, where he was standing by the bar a few minutes ago, but I only managed to catch a glimpse of his red shirt and the sheen of his shaved head as he vanishes into the ether. Jeff has gone too, as if he were never there. One by one, the men silently implode until I am nearly alone, left with a few sad looking stragglers, their arms draped around sets of invisible shoulders. I close my eyes and keep them closed for a few seconds. I don't often pray. But tonight I ask whatever God there might be to calm me down, straighten my head and bring these boys back to life. When I open my eyes, the men have all reappeared exactly where they were standing moments ago. Everything is back to normal. This was just a dream, a hallucination or whatever happens when you drink and sniff too much. But a fear I have never known remains, not the fear of dying. I am familiar with that. Now I'm consumed with terror at the thought of being left behind. What's wrong? Devin asks. You look like you've seen a ghost. A ghost. If he only knew. I've seen ghosts. I've seen ghosts of ghosts. Men turn from flesh into formlessness before my very eyes. I couldn't explain it to him, even if I tried. As you know, I'm you know, the same age, I was in New York at that same time. Uh, and so those, those facts, the way that you capture the sites, particularly the clubs, the peach shows, the culture, right? Um, I guess I want to talk about that in terms of what, what did you see as what was significant and how do you think the reader, um, that helps the reader understand um, black gay men's culture at that time? Just those, the importance of those sites, Keller's. Uh, 96 West, um, where we, we met, connected, and where we shared that information and first witnessed the information. I mean, I, I, I'm not really conscious of, I, like as I wrote, I wasn't really conscious of, of you know, trying to convey anything. Um, I was just writing a story, and those are the spaces in which the story happened. Um, so, you know, I... Uh, and and they and they were you know it was New York and New York was particular um, but they were also universal spaces like you know, um, places every every city big and small in this country had had, had places of, of of its own and you know I did um, <laughs> uh, you know like the book the opening chapter of the book is in, is in in the Rambles yes. in Central Park I mean the, the, the very first scene. Um, the narrator is, is is in the rambles um, at lunchtime on, on his lunch break, like cruising, um, and uh, you know, like I, I I rewrote that scene a few times because I was like, um, people, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, turn people off. You know, I mean, the very first scene, like he's having sex. But, I mean, it's definitely a, a fade to black kind of sex, um, but but you know. But other parts of the book, it is not fake to black sex. I mean, Jewel Gomez described the book as steamy. And I, I mean, that, um, you know, um, I thought that was a highbrow way of saying what the book is. I mean, you know, but, um, you know, I think that was, you know, the life we lived. Um, we went 
Not everybody, because nobody be offended, but yeah. you know, we went to the rambles at lunchtime, um, or you know, the, the peeps, or the that was where you made connections, um, and um, that that, uh, that became, you know that became lovers, that became friends, um, that became you know, um, and I think you know when those when AIDS um, really took hold. Um, in New York, in Atlanta, in LA, in San Francisco, and those spaces began to be closed. Like in, in New York, mm -hmm. Giuliani, you know, closed the bathhouse. You know, and the, it, that was it, it, there was a real loss. One in terms of you know places where we could meet and be sane together. You know, and sort of like create community and, and you know, and, but also a loss in terms of um, you know places where we could educate. You know, he said you you're an AIDS educator. You know, for many years you did that. You know, beautiful work. The funny thing about when Gi Giuliani closed the bathhouses in New York, he left one open, and that, that was Mount Marx um, of the yes. uh, of 120 <laughs> or New York City College. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. No, Mount Marx bathhouse. Oh, um, okay. 124th and uh, Madison. And I just mentioned that because it was black, mm -hmm. and so like you know, you know. You know, they closed down the department, you know, all the, the like the white spaces, mm -hmm. um, but left that one there. That I don't know if it went into the radar. And a lot of really important AIDS education mm -hmm. um, happened in that in that space. Mm -hmm. G Man in particular. G Man. Oh, um, people, people, people of color. People of color in crisis was up there. Mm -hmm. You know, okay. it was you know, and they were in the parks, and you know, um, those spaces were you know spaces where we. You know, try to save each other's lives. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I remember you know being in Prospect Park, like maybe in the late '80s or early '90s. Kind of like rappers everywhere. And there's a scene later in the book, um, towards the end of the book, where you know he he he, he is is up in Prospect Park, and the, you know the condom rappers like sort of littered by confetti. And I I thought you know to me that was a beautiful thing, you know, to see you know people you know. Trying to you know protect themselves and save their lives. Such an important story. I, I, if, if I may, I want to read a line from. This is later on in the book because I think it speaks as uh, it sort of captures what you had, had um, marked about earlier in terms of again um, the, the primacy of sex. Right. Uh -huh. uh, it's in the Veil of Cashmere where you say people outside of the gay life cannot can't fathom why men still come to the parks despite the risk of AIDS, of cops and robbers. They think it's only about tricking. They think that we are oblivious of the perils that gay men can't let go of anonymous, random sex. But the sex that happens here is not anonymous. Names and numbers are exchanged. Um, and you go, you go further to this point where you say, far away from the judgmental eyes of straight people, we are momentarily, we momentarily escape a world that has rejected and forsaken us. It seems happy enough to see us perish. Given the ways in which gay men are often stereotyped and, and our sex and queer men and our sex and our sexuality is seen just exercised in hedonism. Mm -hmm. I love that you, that you placed that there. Mm -hmm. uh, and that you were so explicit or steamy, as Jewel said. Yeah. Um. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would, yeah. Um, that's a very, that is towards the end of the book. And that's a very um, hard chapter. That mm -hmm. chapter, The Veil of Cashmere, it's a hard chapter. Um, the, it, it, does anyone know The Veil of Cashmere? In, in Prospect Park, it's this beautiful little enclave in Prospect Park, um, you know, that, you know, it is called the Veil vale of Kashmir. And it, and it was it, a cruise spot for, for many, many years. That chapter in the book, I'm, I don't want to spoil it for any, anyone, but I, I think this is kind of pretty clear. The, the book is also about addiction. And, um, you know, I, I, at that point in the book, the narrator is at the worst. Well, who, whoever knows what's the worst? You think you know, the worst is it gets worse. Um, so, but at that point in the book, 
you know. And so he comes to the Vale of Kashmir to kind of get out of the house and clear his head, and um, and he's having all these kinds of reflections about okay, you know, people are dying all around me, you know, you know, <coughs> you know um, but this is one place um, I can come and try and find connection, and because that was the best connection that he could find at that point. So that's a sort of a painful chapter, you know. But you know, he does have this, 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 you know, I think important observation about, you know, why are people still gay men still looking for that connection? Um, it's it's with 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 other with other men. It's that connection with community, with humanity. Yeah. And it's so important for that to be understood, given that you know our history and our time. And I'm saying specifically <clears throat> black women um, with the onset of. Of, of AIDS is not nearly as broadly told. Mm -hmm. We're often conspicuously and quite frankly intentionally absent mm -hmm. by commission or omission from the end of band played on and the, and the long time companions, yeah. even Angels in America. Right? Yeah. Right. And so it is critical uh, that we have this kind of look, which is so, it's so intimate. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a documentary. It's not, I mean, but there, but there is, you're clearly telling the soldier's history. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think part of what makes this such a, a precious story is that intimacy with which it's told. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, you, uh, early in, in, the, in, in the chapter you read, you talked about the importance, you uh, tapped into the importance of his friendship, narrative friendship with Jeff and Little Pete. Right. And that seems to be just a recurring thread, like that centrality of friendship. Could you say something about the importance of those friendships for that narrative? Right. Um, Little Pete is my favorite character in the book, even though he's not a major character. Um, mainly because I probably would have wanted to date him. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, kind of got that. yeah, and the thing is, like, that was, you know, you had friends, you know, who you wanted to date, but you didn't because, you know, because you, know, you didn't. I mean, you didn't have to, you know, you could just, you could be friends. And, and I think what's really important about their relationship, their, Jeff and Little Pete are like touchstones, like, throughout the book. You, 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 you get them in the beginning and then you, you get them a little bit later, and through them, you sort of see how the epidemic is evolving and how. Um, there's a little, you know, intimation that you know Jeff may not be well. Um, but like those relationships that sort of he he calls them his bar buddies. They existed in the bar. That that, that what he knew about that he knew about them in the bar. Um, and that was enough. Um, you know that. The, uh, but friendship is a, is a central theme in the book. And I think um, the the friendship that probably is the most. Um, uh, developed in the book is his friendship with Regina. And um, Regina is the sort of, you know, the, the, the you know, second probably most important character in the book. And to me, you know, I, as a gay man, I have always had very uh, close relationships with women. I think many of us, I think many of us have had, you know, sort of, you know, Women, sent women, usually straight women, I think, who are sort of central in our lives that we share a lot with, that are our protectors, maybe when we were kids, you know, and or but become our confidants later on. And so that re relationship he has with Regina is central. And it's interesting because I didn't consciously do this, but uh, the Regina character is biracial, um, and you know, it, it, I just sort of, it just sort of hit me that you know the women in my life who played that kind of central role serial kind of role um, have been black have been white have been asian you know have been brown women and so i think the fact that regina you know his best friend you know um it is is you know the, the importance of that friendship as the narrator you know you know disintegrates um, is is critical. You see, um, in telling Regina's story in particular, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of attention paid to her privilege, right, status, right, that she inherited, right. Um, could you say the significance of that? But also, that's a, a recurring thread. 
It's the way that you also speak to the narrator's dad and mother in terms of um, their their family origins, how the right. dad becomes a postal worker. Right. Right. A buddy of mine who, who just read the book, um, you know, wrote me today and he said, my father was a postal worker too. I'm like, join the club. But, yeah. you know, that, you know, my father was in the army too. I mean, if you were of a certain age, your father was in the army. Um, and, you know, po the post office, that was a good government job. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So, so it was like, you know, coveted. Um, so, uh, Sorry, what was the first part of your question? Just the, just the, the treatment of the, of the, the significance of class and, and right. The status, right? And it, those characters. Well, class, and yeah. class is, you know, you know the, the undergirding of, you know, all of our lives. And I think, you know, the juxtaposition of, of, of the narrator sort of working class um, upbringing with Regina's, you know, Regina's biracial, but she grew up in a, a wealthy, you know, Gold Coast you know, um, home, uh, family. And uh, there's a, one of my favorite, you know, little scenes is, you know, they, they come back from uh, abroad, they're living in Africa and they, come, and they come back and, you know, they stop, you know, they, they're at customs and the custom agent kind of looks at him and says, no, you need more screening. You know, you, you know, just because the custom agent just can't believe he looks in his passport, he can't believe he's been to these kind of places. And Regina, who can pass at times, you know, um, she's ready to like go off on the customs agent, but he gives her a look, and and she 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 checks her privilege because her risk and his risk, they're both at risk, but his risk is greater than hers, and she recognizes that. And, you know, she recognizes her privilege, and that's what I, I, I love about Virginia. There's one of my other favorite scenes is when, you know, they're going to a party, and she, you know, she goes shopping, and she, she comes to the party wearing this uh, Gianni Versace blue leather skirt. And uh, um, she's, she, she, people say, well, where'd you get that? She said, oh, I got it at the bottom of a, of a bin in the Salvation Army. Um, because, and she did. She bought it at Versace, but, she, but, but she's 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 ashamed of her her privilege, and so she's always trying to kind of you know because she's her her racial identity is is also like she's not comfortable you know with her blackness, and so she's constantly trying to like you know um, deny you know her her white privilege, her her upper class privilege, but yeah. I love her. <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of friendships, and you, you didn't, you didn't. Well, uh, you talked about Regina, but another important and central friendship is Zogby. 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 Yeah. Could you talk about Zogby in terms of his role in the narrative life, and why he's so important, and also because with Zogby. You bring in uh, literary references. You bring in uh, Baldwin and uh -huh. others um, in really instrumental ways. Right. Uh, so could you talk about sure. That? Yeah. I mean, Zogby is his uh, is his high school teacher, and um, Zogby is the one who you know sits him down and gives him James Baldwin, you know, to read, and you know um, uh, gives him Kavafi of poetry to read, and you know. Uh, and, and just sort of introduces him to a um, a you know, the beauty of you know gay life and 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 and, and literature, but also you know Zagby also takes him out partying once he's old enough to go out partying. And um, I don't want to give too much away, but I mean Zagby um, uh, has his tragedies um, and. Uh, you know, and then so the narrator is then called upon to show up or not show up. Zogby so gets it very early in, 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 in the book, and you know, I, I think that um, what what I have experienced is around AIDS in the early, you know, in the in the eighties, let's say, before the you know the antiretrovirals, before even there was a, a test, you know, um, you know, when it, there was nothing but a lot of hysteria. And a lot of you know unknown. Um, I think people did you know. I'm sure there were more options than this, but the options I knew about were you showed up, 
you, you know, you sort of, you know, did what you needed to do. You showed up, you took care of people, you nursed people, mm -hmm. you, you, you know, visited people, you know, th those were the brave among us, right? Yes. Other people ran. Um, and did. And hid. And where they hide? They went back and some people went. And I'm not pointing fingers, you know, anybody else, because I'm going to turn them right back on me. And they yeah, they happened. it happened. Some people went back into the closet thinking they could erase all of those years of, you know, uh, you know gay living. And you know, some people went back to the cities that they had, you know, flown to. Away from. Oh, you speaking, man. They went, you know, they went back to, you know, Flint. Your bartender. It, it, the bartender, exactly. He one day he, he just disappeared, went back to whatever, you know, the I call them flyover cities, so that doesn't an offend. But you know, they they because you know, we came to New York and LA and Atlanta and um San Francisco. And so when they started, some people, you know, um flew, you know, flew back thinking that you know that they would be safe if they um some people turned to drugs and alcohol, you know. Some people did all of them, you know, simultaneously, yeah, like yeah. literally, like, sh you know, showed up as AIDS educators, but were also, you know, um, turned to drugs. So, uh, yes. yeah, so it was, it was a terrifying and confusing time. Um, so, I don't know where I was going with this, but. Uh, Scary time. Yes. You said it. You said it. Scary, very scary. As if our own community pushed us away, but they didn't know any better. So when families and church reject you, and then your own community reject you, you did run to the bottle and the needle and, and the bullet show. Because that's how you dealt with it. And I knew more than die from isolation than than anything else. Thank you. Thank you. I want to shift Carrie and um, talk a little bit about you. And uh, if anything, one of one of my uh, what I, one thing I was curious about was your work with other countries mm -hmm. uh, and the importance of that work. Other countries in the moment during the time uh, was chronicling, documenting the impact of AIDS and just Black gay men's lives, black queer life, period. Right. At that time, um, how does that? How do you? How do you see? Well, hmm. there are several brothers from other countries that are no longer here, and I wonder what you think about what um, Colin Robinson and Donald Woods and figures like that would look upon this novel, how they would handle this novel. They've already written it. <laughs> um, they've already written it. I mean, I, I, mm, I, 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 yeah, I mean, I, you know, I have a essay in um, uh, the Lit Hub the last month uh, called The New, New Black Renaissance. Um, you're part of the New, New Black Renaissance. You know, and you, you were part of the, or, New black era in a science fiction. Exactly. Right. But now you've got this new kind of, you know, and you've arrived. And, and, because, and, and, and because of the work that was, was done in that space that was created, there was no space. You know, let me tell you something. Like, you know, when I started um, shopping this book around um, to agents, um, maybe about seven, eight years ago, I uh, you know, had a few agents who read it and went, oh, it looks good, you know, but I'm going to pass. Um, be, because they, they they didn't feel like there was a market for it, um, and uh, now you know there's starting to be a market for really well written you know stories about black queer life. I mean, you know, I could you know I think you know Moonlight, um, uh, you know, uh, A Strange Loop on Broadway, Slave Play on Broadway, um, uh, you know the the the, the uh, Robert Jones, you know. You know, the book The Prophets, it's a great oh, yes. um, you know, Ryan Groom winning the Kirkus Award um, last year. There's this this space in popular culture. You know, what, what's that thing? What's that crazy thing on uh, on who? <laughs> Which one? Yeah, yeah. 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 Some stars. <laughs> what else? <laughs> 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 I watched two episodes and I'm like, I'm gonna have to bookmark this one. <laughs> Come back to you take it all in. Go, 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 go season. Go back to it. I'm <laughs> 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 not 
it's not good. It's not good. No, 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 I shall wave my hands. But, but, yeah, but I mean, there's just, there's a space now, um, in, 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 even in the, in the publishing world. Whereas, like, you know, the other countries, when we were doing this, you, you've got one of the books there somewhere, mm -hmm. yeah. there was no space. And um, that's the third volume. Um, uh, there was no space. Um, you know, so uh, we had to make it. And, uh, you know, and, and there were many um, deaths. You know, passings, um, you know, uh, a Soto Saint, uh, Donald Woods, Red was Jean Marie. Um, I don't want to say they'll start their names, you know, um, but I guess I just did. Um, and then, of course, Essex and Joe, and, you know, like, so I, what I, I guess what I mean is they would have written it already. Okay. I mean, you know, and maybe I would have written it already if they were still here. Maybe, you know, I think that um, that. It, it wasn't just the people who physically got sick and died who died. I mean, I think there were many kinds of, you know, sort of, you know, uh, I'm going to be overly dramatic, but many kinds of, you know, death, yeah. hiding, and, you know, you know, yeah. exactly. And, and so it took me this long mm -hmm. to kind of get my head clear and, you know, find out what, you know, decide that it was really time to write the story. And then it took time to find a way to publish it because I did not have an agent. Um, I could not find an agent, so I, I, I was lucky enough to go directly to a small and independent press, which is Carol Press. Um, and, uh, you know, now it's, it's, it's in the world. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness, right? Yeah. Right. To give me some open the space for questions. We want to encourage folks who are physically in the room to ask questions, and our folks at home will start with folks. Anybody want to start? And I would say, if we and asking, we've got a limited amount of time, so just be um, economical <laughs> with your your questions. And I do speak that. into the microphone, please. Those are quotes you read at first. Any particular reason? You chose those? Yeah. Um, John Retchie, um, who, who wrote City of Night and Numbers in the mid-70s, um, those were seminal um, gay uh, novels, right? And he, brilliant man, um, and but he was always accused of being like a, um, a sex writer. I mean, because his work talked about, you know, being a hustler in L.A., that that was really what his his his, his well at least number uh, uh, city of night was about, right. and um, yeah, and I am drawn to that. Like I'm drawn to like really honest depictions of sex and sexuality, and so he was a real um, sort of luminary for me in terms of um, you know my my writing and, and being unafraid, you know, and unashamed to write about. Sex and, and and you know and I think like I, I hope and I think it's true that I don't write about sex gratuitously when 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 the sex is not an important it, when the sex doesn't tell you anything about the characters then fake then fake black um you can you know characters doing what they do fake black you don't need it but when sex is when you write about sex and it's telling you stuff about the characters then I think right you know like don't 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 shy away. Um, the, 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 you know, like, for example, like, you know, there's one scene where they're having sex and, and it's in the, it's in the late eighties and, and the, the, one of the guys reaches for a condom and that's, that's a really important moment. It tells you what you need to know about that character that he's, he cares about this other guy that he's, um, you know, he's conscious. Exactly. Um, the second quote, um, or the, the epigraph is from Baldwin's, um, you know, uh, just above my head um, and you know some people say you know Giovanni's room is the greatest gay novel ever written I beg to differ you know Bolo was just getting he was just warming up yeah. um, yes. you know with, with Giovanni's room and uh, I mean just above my head I mean uh, it's, it's, 
that scene between Arthur and Crunch. You know, with Crunch. Oh my and God. Like, yeah, it's just yeah, it's so yeah. beautiful. And and what I like about that, that, that quote is it's kind of, you know, the truth. I, like I don't I want I like sinners, you know, I like madmen. That's who I like. I, I, I want I want I want street people. Exactly. I, I want the people who are on the edge. That's that's who's gonna teach me stuff. Um, you know. Uh, men who, people who can teach, people who can learn. So that's why I chose those. Thank you. Questions? I don't know if questions are like statements. I'm going to give you the mic just so everybody can read the book. It's just, I'm, I can't wait to read the book. Thank you. I'm fascinated. But you said something that in the beginning, when he said, that's white boy bullshit. Yeah. That was the the concept that we had in the community. And when my best friend died, I said, that's impossible. He didn't sleep with white boys, but he. And I can't have HIV because I don't sleep with white boys. And when I was diagnosed in 1990, I tried to leave this damn planet. So when you brought that out, okay. I just felt it, it needed to be told, because I was told I wouldn't live to be 45, and I just turned 75. Oh. Um, in the opening lines of the book, uh, uh, Craig was saying, uh, or, or one of you was saying that, that, that it wasn't just New York. There were so many places like that. Um, I remember in Atlanta there was this place called Cypress Street. Right? It, it was, it was people from all walks, you know, would be there. And I and I it, it's pre-internet and pre, you know, uh uh chat. No, it's like pre-gay marriage or the the, the assimilation oh, okay. and integration into right the mainstream and it. I find myself, even as you were talking about it, uh, I don't know if I'm romanticizing it, but I feel like like those spaces where we all were because we all, that was the only place we could be, so everybody had to be there. If you wanted to see or be seen, uh, you, you had to be in that place. I feel like those spaces have disappeared. I, Am I romanticizing that? I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. They have disappeared. I mean, you know, the, the, the I mean, one after the other, they kind of fell. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, you know, as a man of a certain age, I, I, I don't try and do the thing of, oh, so much better in our day, and you know, oh, these boys in day got nothing. They're all on the internet, blah, blah. you know, because that's their reality, and you know, it might be. You know, it's whatever it's it, it's right. it's. But in terms of romanticizing it, um, you know, uh, there's a there's a chapter um, called uh, uh, Paradise Regained, and it is about the Paradise Garage. Mm -hmm. uh, well, <laughs> it, it, yes, it is about the Paradise Garage, and it's set in the Paradise Garage. And you know, the Paradise Garage is iconic, and you know, and roman romanticized, and like there, there's a their whole their whole you know Facebook pages. Mm -hmm. Dedicated to the Paradise Garage reunions, Reun reunions, and, and, and right, and people will cut you if you say something, you know, that negative about the Paradise. It's like really like heartfelt. Um, you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> but in the end, it was it was just a nightclub. It was really a, but I, it was it was just a, a, a really nice nightclub. But but I, but but I think what happened was um it was a very nice nightclub. <laughs> you know it was, it, it was it was it was quite the quite the thing. Um you know but but I think what happened was like uh, like the that space um you know you may, may, may put your heart you know other places and you got better days, colors, you know um nickel bar better days, nickel bar, all these places which one? Two potato. Two potato. All these places started sort of imploding and closing, like like just as um you know the the the, epi 
epidemic was just kind of, you know, like reaching fever pitch. Yeah. And, and so there was this confluence, I think, of, of, of like, you know, the spaces in which we were like getting our life, right, um, are, are, are being taken from us, you know, just as our friends and beloveds are being taken from us. And we, we are doubtful about our own exist, our own continued existence. So I think those places that were taken from us became kind of, I mean, as great as they were, they became even larger and more significant and more kind of wonderful. There was also drugs. So let's, let's add this. Um, so, so, yeah. <laughs> so like you were an acid trip or something, Carlos Garage, you know. It's all about the punch. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah. I'm really excited to read the book. Uh, it's good to see you again. I met you probably 20 years ago. You came as a guest um, when I invited you to Brown University. So I will be like, 1999. Oh, wow. um, I know you've done a lot of work in Africa, and I'm just curious as to what are the ways that you feel like the lives of Black queer men in Africa sort of are in conversation with the lives of Black queer men in the United States, and sort of what do you see as kind of through lines in those experiences? That's yeah. A question. No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's you know, the, 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 distance, the, the distance between this room right here in Africa has grown much, much smaller um, in in the last, you know, since I was at Brown. Um, you know, uh, one, because there's so many Africans, uh, you know, um, here, and, you know, Africans who, especially Nigerians, who, 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 they're very mobile people, who, you know, and they are, you know, one, one out of every four Africans is a Nigerian. Um, so, so um, they're they're moving and they're bringing culture with them, you know, and, and including queer culture, um, and you know, standing up for their rights. And there's still a lot of violence against um, gay men and lesbians and trans folks in Africa, lots and lots. Um, but there are also organizations, you know, uh, you know, that are fighting for you know rights and um, you know AIDS treatment organizations, and and so the 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 through line, I think, is that um, the, we're, we're, we're all kind of fighting for the same thing, and we're, we're getting, you know, sort of closer culturally. I mean, I think, you know, Africans in America now, um, you know, you've got Africans who are, you know, um, who are African Americans, who are, you know, you know, second generation. So I think that there's a lot of melding of cultures um yeah thank you and there, there's several chapter well, well sort of uh -huh. in midway or just past midway um the narrator's experience with the peace corps uh when he's in africa yeah in, in, say yeah he, there are several chapters set in in africa and it's um um in it's it's the mid 80s so um they're set in Zaire, a country which no longer exists and um, the, the uh, you know, there's this great essay by uh, Benyavanga Wainana, I don't know if, if anyone is familiar with it, um, a, a Kenyan, queer Kenyan writer who has pa passed away a few years ago. And it's called, um, do, you know, do you know that essay? Yeah. It's called How to, How to Write About Africa. Mm -hmm. And in it, and it's, it's satirical. Mm -hmm. And he says, every time <clears throat> you write about Africa, you should write about wild animals in the streets. You should write about murderous dictators. You should write about the big sky. Um, and um, and I pretty much write about all of those things. Um, you know, and he's saying, you know, he, he, he's being satirical. He's saying like that's what every that's what you Americans do. You write about, you know, um, all you can write about is the murderous dictator. And I have a chapter in the book called The Dictator. And like I didn't know him, but like we knew people who knew each other. He, he died. I really wanted to talk to him because I don't think what he was saying is don't write about murderous dictators because there are murderous dictators. Um, I think what he was saying, if you're going to write about Africa, write about it with nuance and with with subtlety and with and with you know depth. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, in in those chapters, um, the you know the narrator is. Um, you know, he, 
he's in this relationship with this African man, and I don't mind to give, give it away, but like he does have this 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 blackmail kind of scenario, which is I think the the, the most significant human rights abuse that happens from, from, from Africans. Um, and he African gay gays and lesbians, and the narrator, you know, is is blackmailed, but and but he's got money, he can just pay the money and it'll be okay. But for his his partner, who's an African. The, the the risk is 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 enormous. Um, so I mean the the through line may be violence and uh, you know trying to trying to overcome the violence that the states um, that you know we live in you know inflict upon us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm, the blackmail. I was going uh -huh. to Ghana and. I panicked because someone told me that a lot of people would pretend to be gay, uh -huh. and then if you spent time with them, they would blackmail you. So I, I panicked and didn't go, but I am going to go. And get Please go. But just, go. Before you go, connect with people who know down a little bit and mm -hmm. can you know keep you you know on the you know a, a safe path. That is true. What you've just said, that the, there's a lot of violence. Ghana is a funny place because. Um, you can dance in the house before I start. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about, uh, in trouble here. Uh, but at one point, when you when you get to the airport in Accra, there was a big sign, like right at customs, when you walked in, there was a big sign that said homosexuals, um, child molesters, and sex traffickers turn around right now. Wow. I, I'm not kidding. Wow. I'm not kidding. In the airport. In the airport. In the airport. And so I'm the team. I'm not kidding. But I'm like, I'm not turning around. <laughs> but yes, I live in Africa. Still in Africa is still a challenging um, place. Though, I mean, there's lots of queer culture going on in, in big cities around Africa. Yeah. Accra. And any city in Nigeria and South Africa. South Africa has the most progressive yes, I love you know, South Africa. legislation. I mean, it's one of the first countries in the world to, you know, legalize um, you know, same-sex same -sex marriage. Um, you know, has 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 stayed true to the, com the original commitment of the African National Congress um, to protect gay rights because gay people, you know, fought alongside um, you know, uh, you know in, in the movement. You know, in, in, in the ANC with Mandela and others, so you know they have made they have remained true to that commitment. I've been to South Africa. I just panicked hearing I'm, that information. I'm about glad it. you I want you to be safe. The next yeah. time, oh, contact me or you know be in yeah. touch with some folks who can. I will. I will. Because I am going. Good. What's your next project? You know, um, Sarah Shulman told me I shouldn't talk about it too much until, oh, I, okay. until I do like you and find myself somebody who's going to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 yeah. But I do have a next project. Okay. And it's going to be uh, uh, historical. It's going to be set. I want to set it around. I want to do a historical kind of fiction thing, like maybe set in the, in the Harlem Renaissance. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm two chapters in. I'm looking forward to finishing it. Thank you. It's it <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. Congratulations again. So I think that's a great place to stop and say goodbye to our friends who are watching virtually at home. Um, Gus Kaufman said after reading, I just want to say congratulations, and this was such a beautiful and powerful event. So thank you to everybody uh, in our Atlanta community and the New York community for watching with us tonight. If you do not yet have your copy of Desire Lines, you can buy a signed copy from Karen's. By clicking the teal link right here. You can also support the work of Kara Circle at any time. We really do appreciate it. And we're going to go ahead and say goodnight to y'all.